Thank you so much to all of our speakers for coming and giving such interesting perspectives on where they're at and their views on the challenges that we're currently being faced uh, in all sorts of directions. Could I get an idea of how many people have questions for our panel? Just a show of hands if you've got a question, do you think? Because if there's not too many, then I might oh, after Ellen hijack it a little bit myself. Ellen. Ellen. Tim and Nick together because we talked about kind of what Tim brought up, you know, I'm okay with you doing this, I'm okay with you going to this extent, I'm okay with you exploring content. And Nick, a lot of your content, the way it went viral was based on social media use and kind of people sharing the content with their friends, tweeting it, putting it on Facebook, etc. So where do you draw the line between something that comes up in the copyright industry is should we have an exception for social media use? Should that be permitted? Like, where do you draw the line between what should be monetized or what you want control over and what we're quite happy to take place? You can uh, go first. <laughs> ah, you bastard. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, w this is stuff we've got to work out. Um, so, you know, let's workshop this. I'm, I'm Nick and someone has taken my whale and has made a show with it and has put it online and it's suddenly gone viral. So now Nick's got two reactions. He can call up his lawyer to send a cease and desist letter and then sue the person. Or he can think, okay, actually there's gonna be a lot of cross promotion here. So I'm gonna try and do a deal with this person. Now one of, of those approaches is partly defined in law, has a sort of low risk of failure, or if you like, you know, just involves paying lawyers some money, and you're pretty sure you're gonna get the outcome, but it doesn't necessarily open up any new opportunities for you. And then the other one is kind of speculative. The person might be a prick, the person might be really nice, the person might be scared that you've called them, and so you may not be able to come to a deal because everyone just gets a bit too freaked out about it. Um, unless you've got a lovely pro forma that says, you know, I do these deals all the time, trust me, Google me, LinkedIn, I've got a reputation, so do business with me, and you know, I'm, I'm good on you for using our character, good on you for making all this money, now here's my cut, and here's an invoice, and, and then let's work together. Those two models, you know, wh which one are you gonna go with, you know, when you've got a lunch date, at, you know, you gotta, it's, it's, that's pretty much how it rolls, right? Mm. So for me, um I was intentionally not given a microphone. <laughs> just, just don't speak. Um, for me personally, it, it's it's kind of that you know, if people do want to share it and do want to push it, it helps me ultimately because it gives exposure to my product or property or whatever you want to um, call it. And there are a few instances where there was a guy who started making beach as jewellery in New Zealand. He was making these amazing silver brooches with gold chips and stuff like that and selling them for five, six hundred bucks. And I was like, jumped on the phone, gave the guy a call and he happened to be the nicest human being on earth. So I said, bro, 50-50. Send me an email saying 50-50 and we're all good. Um, then I found that there was a really organised couple in WA who started to sell Beach Daz um, shirts of all our characters, of which I think we had something like 12, 13. And they were organised. They had beached as shoes. They had beached as bags and blah, blah, blah. And I called up this dude and he was like, um, I was like, hey man, um, look, I'm one of the creators of Beached As and it seems like you guys have set up a store and, and are selling heaps of my stuff. And he's like, oh, yeah, oh, it's, it's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Fully started blaming his wife, and you heard in the background like. I was like, this is kind of not okay. So based on that, I was like, I don't, I wouldn't do biz with these people. So I sent a really kind of lovely email to them, and then I had my lawyer do up a bit of another email. So it's very conditional, I think, in the space that I'm at. Um, there are people who also sell it at markets and blah blah blah. And it's like, am I going to chase everyone up? Probably not. You know. Can I, can I make a point that? We just met, <laughs> and we didn't rehearse this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you set that up really well. We got a good thing going. <laughs> that's here. really good. Yeah. White guys in suits. We can do that. You know. I think that's been done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've got a question for everybody on the panel. I'd love to hear what you, what from your different perspectives, what do you see as really being the biggest 
barriers to uptake of legitimate content. And Tim, I especially want to hear from you because one thing I found really striking in the ad that you had up for Quick Flicks is that it said stream hundreds, stream from hundreds of movies and TV shows. And I was like, hundreds? I mean, I was at my friend's house the other day that he had hundreds of DVDs. There was nothing I wanted to watch. That's not enough. So what are the, the biggest barriers to the legitimate uptake of content? Sure. So um, we actually do have thousands of pieces of content, but we include TV shows, as in a whole season, as a, as a single title. So, yeah, so that's still hundreds. It's still hundreds, exactly. Uh, I mean, th the biggest challenge we have here in Australia is scale. Um, and uh, we have to pay minimum guarantees to our partners, uh, which is a sort of standard way of doing business that they do around the world. And our challenge as a company is to make enough from our business, our businesses, our posts and our streaming business to cover the cost of those minimum guarantees. And uh, the, the minimum guarantees are tied into how many titles that you can license at any one time. So Netflix, they got lucky that it a deal with a group called Stars a bunch of years ago. These little internet geeks walked in, oh yeah, we'll do a little deal with you guys on the site and make some money. And then Netflix became this gigantic company that everyone was freaked out by. Stars turned around and said, well, actually, this is the price now because you guys are really successful. And Netflix said, well, no, we're not going to pay that. So Netflix actually ended up pulling literally thousands of titles out of their service because they didn't want to pay the industry. That's an example of people trying to work stuff out, you know, and working it out in the commercial space in full public view, etc. Quick Flix, you know, we don't, we don't have a rapid, we don't have a population of 300 million. We have a much smaller population and so we've got to be much more careful should, should I say respectful partner partnering with our, our colleagues in in the US in the UK and all these other markets who are the content owners and um, we need to do business with them and if we don't respect the terms of their distribution agreements with us then they won't take our calls S Steve what about you I know you've got really strong views on this yeah surprise surprise um, I, I think it's very simple it, it's very simple but it's also very complicated and and there's no doubt that Tim can, uh, can you know, e describe in detail why it is so complicated and I'm in violent agreement with that. But from a consumer's perspective, I think that the consumer just wants it to be straightforward, simple and available. Available when he or she wants it. So whether that's an, an old article or an old um, movie or TV show or it's a brand new latest release, they want it to be easily, easily found and in, then easily consumed. And um, today, there's still a lot of stuff that it's much easier to pinch than it is to buy. And, uh, you know, the, the mainstream, I, I have friends who are grandparents who routinely uh, torrent stuff because it's mainstream. It's easy, it's not complicated, everybody that they know does it. And the stuff's available, whatever it is that they're after, um, and they can't buy it. I can't buy it. So, yeah, I think it's the, the, the word available is, is a fairly broad, has broad meaning. Um, and these, you know, the sort of comments that people make that I've seen that it's unreasonable for consumers to tell the suppliers when they want to watch stuff. I mean, that, that just speaks volumes about their attitude to those people. They'd rather treat them as offenders than as customers. Again, Gabe Newell says that he treats piracy as a form of market research. It helps him find where the demand is for his product. And then he satisfies that. He provides a, a better quality product uh, and it's packaged up in such a way that the, that the consumer who have shared or copied or pinched that content, typically games, uh, they get a better, better quality product when they buy it. And when they can, and they can buy it at you know, he, he runs sales very regularly, chops 75% off the price. And people dive in uh, and buy the, the cheap stuff, and while they're there, they buy the expensive stuff too. So he's making a lot of money out of, uh, out of that model by, by using piracy as a, a marketing tool to yes. determine where the demand is and, and deliver on that demand. So we, we could probably spend the rest of the week mm. talking about it. Yeah. Can I just make one? Can I make one? Yeah. I just want to make one quick point. I think, I think it's, not, it's not helpful for us to create a, a little you know, doll of some executive out there in the media industry who hates consumers 
you know, these people want to sell, we want to sell things. We want to give people what they want. And, and you look at piracy and we look at that and go, whoa, look at all these people who are getting digitally enabled and want this content. So it's market research that they, they have to respond to. And sooner or later, if they don't respond to it, they'll be fired. What you're not seeing is people who have it in for consumers. What you're seeing is people who are uncertain, mm. who are trying to manage risk, who have certainty about the physical model and, the and they have certainty about how it's declining and they have uncertainty about the digital model and when it's going to be able to replace it. That's it. Mm. But this is Tarzan economics. This is swinging along on the vine that you've been swinging along for a while. It's starting to unravel. You're losing your grip. You can see the other vines you've got to move to, but you just don't know which one to choose. You know, which of these competing vines? And, and you can't wait until you're absolutely certain which is the perfect vine to jump to because the vine that you're clutching onto is just going to let you drop to the ground. But you, you can say, and Hollywood says, and, and big content says all the time, we want to sell you our product. But I regularly have experiences where I spend half an hour or 45 minutes trying to find legitimate versions of content. Then I discover I simply cannot obtain a legitimate version. That money is left on the table, and this is an experience replicated. I see a lot of people nodding around the room. The experience is replicated over and over. So they need to choose a vine. I don't think it's I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think online's going to dominate physical. I don't think online's going to dominate TV. I think it's it, it'll just become another platform, really, and it's evolving to that point. So it's in this weird wild west at the moment where people don't exactly or big companies or smaller or medium-sized companies don't exactly know how to monetize it, but it's an evolving beast like anything new. And um, physical is a really important part of what we did with Beach Daz and, and Supre. The fact that it was physical, it, it asserts a different thing in the marketplace versus what we were doing online. Um, we sold, I think, between 15 and 20,000 DVDs of Beach Daz, which I found the most bizarre thing on planet Earth. I was almost like resentful. It's like, who the f would buy that, you know? But people want to people have it. You build it and they will come like um, one of those quotes said. <laughs> you build it, make it better, Field and of pardon? Field of dreams. Yeah, that's right. Field of dreams. Has anyone got any other questions? This one. Marcus, look, I did notice, and when people say they're trying to avoid the question, it always means it's worth asking. Uh, geotagging, geospatial management. Let's take two or three dimensions of this. First one is the sea basically means that uh, it has to resist having to tag where particular transit materials is coming from because of that, and of course this is part of that thing. The Kindle debate, which was put across beautifully, except for the fact that Kindle decided to withdraw stuff that had already been licensed and deleted from every Kindle on the planet. Uh, secondly, the use of geospatial uh, location completely undermines what is a globally mobile uh, working model. You simply can't use your own stuff in perfect commerce, which activates piracy and looks very law abiding people. And thirdly, the most alarming of all is the use of the internet and profiles in order to stratify the prices dealt with in other markets. I don't mean the simplistic Aussie tax that we seem to get from wholesalers. I mean the use of social networking to track it and then price accordingly. And so the anti competitive nature of the first use doctrine in books, which are all prices that we're paying. These innovations are free. They're additional tax. And these are where the market is losing credibility of the copywriters, which is regarded as not only irrelevant, but the only way you can personalize it is to demonize the, uh, the greater suppliers. And there will be nothing to stop that happening. So the geospatial issue of that stratification, you try by There are a few little things like this, which are simply not credible, and people are always shocked when it draws their attention, particularly the Kindle withdrawal, the loss of the first two stops, the inability to carry the materials. These exploitations of geospatial are growing. I can see a number of market opportunities for the engineer over here in exploiting these, but we need a balance. I think it's very helpful to have the panel kick off, say, one aspect of each of those, because they're serious. 
I'll take it on. I'll take it on. Um, okay, so first of all, the important thing is, is don't beat up the distributor, right? Don't beat up us, don't beat up QuickFlix because we have to enforce the terms of the agreement that the copyright holder has asked us to enforce. Um, if we don't enforce those geo-blocking terms, then they won't do business with us when they come and audit us. Now, as a, as a consumer, I'm exactly like you. What the hell? Why can't I just do anything I want? You know, I want a DVD player that's region free, I want to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and, and, and that's exactly the behavior that I want. And I think we will get there. I believe we will arrive at that place. The, the, uh, the unfortunate you know, explanation I'll give you is, is that why is something p potentially more expensive in Australia than it is in the USA? Economies of scale. The person in Australia has a lot of similar fixed costs which are of the same order of magnitude as the person in the US, yet the person in the US has massive scale of revenue, whereas the person in Australia has a much lower scale. So they choose a higher ARPU and they go, I will get a lot, I'll get a smaller uptake, but at least I'll be able to pay my bills. So at the end of the day, I don't see there's some master plan of world domination here. There is definitely a disconnect between what consumers want and what the companies are able to give them. But I'm, I'm you know, from a copyright or a law or a commercial point of view, I'm asking the question, why is it so? And it's not that they're bad people, because they want to sell you stuff. The, the reason it's usually so is because of some underlying economic challenge. Um, a big American company doesn't know how to do business in Singapore, appoints a local distributor who does and can do customer support, but that local distributor has a population of six million versus. So that, that's kind of the why. Um, uh, moral and ethical annoyance on our part as consumers, yeah, I get that, but you know, we've got to be careful. We're, not, not we've got to be careful who we vent, but you know, we can be, in, we, we, can be we, we perhaps need a little bit more compassion that can be used in a more constructive way to make change, uh, I think. What will we accept? Will we accept no local distributors and we only want to do business with giant global corporations? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Steve, you got one quick response to that? Uh, yeah, I, I think I ought to put uh, another side to that and you know, pick up on the point of economies of scale. When, when the consumer actually pays for the distribution, there, there is no economies of scale. So if I want to buy uh, content from Europe or the US or China or Singapore or wherever it is in the world, when I access my internet, I'm accessing a global network. I'm not accessing a geo-locked local network that I then have to arrange for an interconnection. It just is global. Uh, and there's no least cost routing on the internet. It just takes whatever route it likes and, uh, and picks it up. So, you know, I, I just don't buy the economies of scale unless you're talking about physical distribution. With digital distribution, um, to me, if I want to buy something from Disney, and watch it, uh, either pull it down to iTunes or something and watch it on my flat screen TV or watch it on my iPad or my iPhone, I just don't understand an argument that says there are different economies of scale and therefore I should pay more than the bloke in Philadelphia. No, I don't think you can actually. Oh. I think we really do have to stop because we've already run quite well, a bit over. But we'll grab you at ah, ah, we'll yeah. grab you at lunchtime. Don't worry about it. All right. Thank you so much to Steve, Tim, and Nick for coming and sharing their time with us and being so generous <laughs> to want to share even more.